Hello, and welcome to today's NIASC Virtual Global Forum on Essential Assessment. I am Allison Geary, Deputy Director of the NIASC Commission on Public Schools, and with me today is George Edwards, Chief Accreditation Officer at NIASC. We are so pleased to have staff and students from the Francis Wayland Parker Charter Essential School and the Theodore R. Sizer Teachers Center here with us today. By sharing their personal stories and examples, they will demonstrate how inquiry and standards-based assessment projects can transform a student's learning experience. Assessment is a challenge for many during normal times and is particularly a daunting challenge in our current virtual learning environment. In today's forum, we will hear how one public school in Massachusetts is implementing research-based assessment. And we'll not only hear about the assessment from educators, but also from students. As always, please remember to add your questions to the Q&A and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can before the session is over. And now I'd like to hand things over to my co-host George to get the webinar started. Thank you, Allison. And I'd like to also welcome everyone uh, to our forum today. And thank you for taking the time to be with us. We have a large number of people from around the world who are joining us. This is one of the most popular uh, topics that have been suggested for us for our webinars. And so we're happy to be able to bring it to you today. And we're also thrilled that we have two students who will be joining us for our webinar. The Parker Charter Essential School serves students uh, in middle school and high school grades. We'll be seeing examples of assessments used uh, with their high school grades, but the elements of research-based assessment are also applicable for middle schools and elementary school students. Good assessment trans transcends the pandemic and it also transcends grade levels. We like to say good assessment is good assessment. The idea for good assessments are also very well aligned to our standards for accreditation. Whether you're serving in a public school, an independent school or an international school, you will see alignment between the practices that you hear about today and the standards for your commission. Before we hear more and dive into the discussion, I'd like to start with some introductions. So let me begin by introducing Colleen Meany from the team from Parker and ask her to introduce uh, her colleagues and students. Colleen? Good morning, George. Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Colleen Meany, and I'm director of the Sizer Teacher Center at the Parker School. And I'm glad to be joined by my colleagues and students, and I'll let them take it from here for that introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Diane Cruzy, and I'm the Math Science Technology Domain Leader at Parker. Um, I teach math, and I also oversee the work of the department. Trevor, you want to go next? Hi, I'm Trevor. I'm a senior at Parker. Hi, I'm Ruby. I'm a junior at Parker. Okay. Thank you guys, and I think we're ready to go. So um, I want to give a special shout out to our elementary audience. Uh, we take a lot of inspiration from you at the Parker School, and um, I hope that becomes visible in our work today. Uh, so this is the, the Parker School, um, when the flowers bloom. <laughs> uh, so this is essential assessment. And um, what I want to share with you is what uh, the Parker School is founded on, which are the 10 common principles of the Coalition of Essential Schools. Um, and those include things that um, should feel natural to us, but uh, represent a mission statement or a set of core values and beliefs for us at Parker. For example, helping students learn to use their minds well. Uh, less is more. We really believe in depth over coverage. We think goals apply to all students. Personalization matters. Um, we want to see students demonstrate their skills um, and we're committed to democracy and equity among others. Uh, and at Parker, we often say we're fond of having a conversation among friends. Uh, this comes directly from Ted Sizer, who founded the school, along with a handful of hopeful parents. Uh, Ted was the former dean of the Graduate School of Education at Harvard and leader of the Annenberg Institute at Brown. 
And because it's the um, celebrating women month here uh, in the United States and everywhere, I hope I wanted to recognize uh, some of our female leaders at Parker, which are many, Deb Miriam, Sumasuko, Diane Cruzy, Ruth Whalen Crockett, Debbie Osofsky, Mandy Levine, and Kathy Russo. Um, I celebrate their work and the leadership they bring to Parker. Uh, as George said, we are a seventh through 12th grade school. Uh, we have students about 12 to 18 years old and 400 students. We are a charter school in our state, which is still a public school. And we were part of the first round of charter schools in Massachusetts that opened uh, in 1995. We have uh, four domain structures or domains in at the Parker School. So we integrate subjects that would be arts and humanities, math, science, technology, Spanish, and wellness. And if you were to visualize a student schedule at Parker, these are the four classes you would see students taking part in every day. Uh, and likewise, we have criteria for excellence that correspond to those domain areas. So you can see arts and humanities, we have writing, reading, research, oral presentation, artistic expression, listening and media analysis, and in math, science, technology, technical communication, mathematical problem solving, scientific investigation, systems thinking, and technology. And these go on to include Spanish and wellness. And you'll hear more about arts and humanities and MST, as we say, later on. Uh, so one example in MST is uh, problem solving. So when teachers work with the criteria for excellence, they'll have a bulleted list of indicators that signal uh, meeting expectations. And then they take those bullets and apply those to a rubric. I know this isn't entirely visible, but um, you'll get the presentation. And I really want to just make the point that these indicators become part of a teacher's rubric. Um, and they indicate levels of achievement from beginning, approaching, to meeting. Uh, and that's what our assessment language is. You can see that's um, where students move. Um, we take some cues from the acquisition of learning a musical instrument, say. Uh, if you're learning piano, first you're a beginner, maybe then you're approaching expectations and soon you're meeting them. Um, but we don't think of student achievement as F or D or B or 79 or 85, um, we use these categories instead and we think of assessment as a journey, uh, one that all students are welcome to, one that students take their own pace at and uh, we believe in them to getting there. Uh, this is a professional practice that you will see in a variety of NIAS standards across the commissions, um, but one in the public school commission is to ensure that grading and assessment practices are aligned with the school's beliefs about learning. And this one is close to our heart. Um, as I mentioned about music, it's also true about riding a bike. Um, if you can't ride a bike in the fall, um, do you have an F? If you're falling off the bike in the winter, do you have a C? And then if you're riding later in the spring, do you have an A? And then does that mean you have, I don't a 74 for bike riding? Uh, we don't think of learning like that at Parker. Once you are riding the bike successfully and all along the way, we think of you as beginning, approaching, or meeting. Um, that this is the way that we envision assessment and it's the way in which our assessment criteria uh, are shown. So just a couple of more things about curriculum instruction and assessment at Parker. We have team teaching for all of our youngest grades, seventh grade through 10th. We use essential questions, projects, rubrics, students keep their work in portfolios. 
Uh, we have a very strong commitment to heterogeneous classes. We do not believe in sorting students by perceived ability. We think ability um, can surge and plateau at different times and that wherever a student's achievement is at say 11 years old or 12 years old, they shouldn't be plugged in to a particular level for a long time or tracked as some uh, might say. We think that um, their achievement will grow and we believe in them and we don't sort them by perceived ability or ability that might be measured by standardized tests, which are widely known to have biases built into them. So that's part of equity for us. Um, another commitment we have is to revision. Students are allowed to revise their work uh, after they receive teacher feedback. And when they do, they receive the new grade or the new assessment um, for that. It's not averaged with a previous um, designation. So for us, just to summarize and, and then hand this off, the key systems for us um, regarding equity, again, are not sorting students. We do not segregate students based on achievement. Um, we have it set up where Parker teachers have one academic preparation for the most part. Our older teachers who teach older students have two preparations, but mostly one. Um, we support robust common planning time. This is daily and weekly, hours of common planning time. We use protocols for efficient collaboration among educators and educators share the work. If you're responsible for teaching grades seven and eight, you have a team of five other colleagues at our school who work with you and teach the exact same thing. Uh, so everyone shares the load, everyone takes responsibility for a unit. Um, you're not alone. There's a platinum platter of curriculum that uh, teachers draw from. So there's not this exhaustion of original creation all the time. There's um, a really strong body of work from which teachers draw and support each other. Okay. So we, I'm going to welcome our students. We have Ruby and Trevor with us and Ruby is going to help us out first. And you'll see Ruby spotlighting um, what her project is that she's going to tell us about. And then later what she learned and what she learned about herself as a learner. How are you doing Ruby? I'm feeling pretty good, thank you. Alrighty, um, hello everybody. Uh, as Colleen said, my name is Ruby and I'm a junior. I did the assessment that I'm going to show you guys when I was a sophomore, so last year. And this one was about uh, the Civil War, spe specifically post-Civil War reconstruction. And we can just get right into it. It was a very fun assessment. So this assessment was uh, a llama and an OP, which are two skills that we have in AH. Llama stands for listening and media analysis, as you see at the top, which is basically uh, when you can take a piece of media, and that can be literally anything. It can be like as academic as a study, or it can go into just a crazy wild creative piece of graffiti art or anything. Just anything that you can analyze and make a claim about is the skill of media analysis. And OP is oral presentation. So your skill to present it like I am doing right now. Uh, this specific assessment uh, was looking at the lost cause narrative, which is the perception of the Civil War and post-Civil War reconstruction, uh, generally in the South, is where it's perpetuated a lot. Uh, sometimes schools are taught with the lost cause narrative, or just that's what a lot of people learn in the South, especially 
uh, a very a, a long time ago when the war had just ended. And so I looked at a bunch of pieces that came out of the lost cause narrative, just any sort of media. And I analyzed them as you would for Llama. And then I got to present them in a PowerPoint presentation. Like you see here, this was my PowerPoint. The first piece of media that I looked at was very simple. It was just a summary of statistics on how people perceive the Confederate flag. And what I learned through that one was that uh, those who learn the lost cause narrative have a very positive view on it generally. Uh, the next one was a lot longer and had a lot more to it. Uh, I listened to a speech and what was interesting about analyzing that one is that what struck me wasn't really what I heard in the speech as much as what I didn't hear because I had heard a lot about slavery when learning about the Civil War and the liberation of slaves. And that was not present here when talking about the history of the Civil War. It was more just about the North fighting with the South. So I definitely learned that the Lost Cause doesn't focus on certain parts of American history. And then I got to analyze some more creative works. I got to analyze a song, The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down, and a story a very old story, which was very interesting to look at. Also how, again, narratives impact uh, creative works. And I definitely, I learned a lot from this assessment. You don't really often get to see in schools how other people are learning. You just kind of learn about it the way that you're learning about it. So it was very eye-opening to see people don't learn about the same facts the same way, the way you do. And I think that that's something that uh, translates into learning at Parker uh, very well, actually. Obviously here, uh, it kind of erases some facts, but at Parker, uh, people don't learn the same way either and it's about teaching people in different ways we got to look at a lot of different pieces of media and choose which ones we wanted to analyze i didn't have to do the four that i did and it was um analyzing the ones that um stick out to you so in that way there was a bit of adjustment and that was nice i enjoyed that about assessment Thank you, Ruby. Okay, Trevor. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Trevor, and I'm a senior at Parker. And the guiding question for this assessment that I'm going to be sharing with you is, how can we quantify and describe change? And so the assessment I'm sharing with you guys today is, what is a derivative? And this project called for us to condense our whole first unit, everything that we learned about what is a derivative in seven minutes, um, which was a challenge. And so we had learned about um, derivatives staying in tangent lines, uh, slope at an instant, limits. And this project was assessed for technical communication. And that means that we're taking our understanding of a concept or our work, and we're trying to effectively communicate it to an audience in a way that they can understand and um, in a succinct and efficient way. Um, so for this project, you have, you have the ability to personalize, similar to how Ruby, you could choose different forms of media to analyze. In this assessment, you're able to choose um, which medium you will be using to communicate uh, your understanding. And so I chose a PowerPoint um, and I took video of myself for each slide explaining the concepts on each slide. And I, I made an outline for myself and um, yeah. And here is a short video of my assessment. So the derivative is, is basically just another word for slope. Now what it is, is it's the instantaneous rate of change um, 
an absolute single point in time on a function, or it is the slope of an entire function. I wanted to revisit slope real quickly. So if we have a function, we have two points on that function, then we can find the average rate of change between those two points. And so if we use the point slope form, um, we can find and use the slope between those two points, the average rate of change between those two points, um, then we can create a linear function. And that linear function will be a second line. It's a, it's a line that goes between two points on a function. We have two points and we can model the ins uh, we can model the rate of change between those two points with a linear function. But if we want to find the instantaneous rate of change for one point, we're going to make we we're going to want to make those two points become closer and closer together until there's really only one point. So how we do that is we make the change in x that run smaller and smaller and smaller. So we're going to make that change in x shrink towards zero. So the main idea of local linearity is that <clears throat> whenever we zoom in real close on in on a function near one point, you're going to start to see a straight line emerge. And so when we put uh, another linear function, a tangent line near that point, it's going to match up exactly on top of each other. And that's what you're seeing here in that interval between those two black lines is that you're seeing that the tangent line is matching up right over onto that point um, in between that interval. <laughs> okay. Um, so what you can probably see from that is it wasn't, uh, of course, I rehearsed beforehand, but it was still off the fly and you were able to see my personality come through and you may have heard some ums and some stutters, which is fine because this is just trying to um, this is active recall. This is trying to get me to try to talk about it in my own understanding, in my own words. Um, and that's something that I really loved about this assessment is because I'm an oral processor. And so I do really well when I'm able to recommunicate the information that I'm taking in. And then when I do that, I build a greater understanding. When I have a greater understanding of the concept that I'm learning, I'm more equipped to be able to effectively communicate to my audience. Um, and something else too with this assessment is I have always struggled with this idea of quality over quantity. Um, when I came into Parker, I was very focused on, do I have the quantity, right? Do I have everything that I need? Um, and that would sometimes muddle my point. And so with this assessment, it really challenged me to ask, what is, what is the most important information here? What is vital to, um, understanding this whole unit and I was able to do that I was able to trim it down and effectively use visuals and um, work off of my strength of being an oral processor so yeah it was a great growth opportunity thank you Trevor okay so Thanks for sharing that, Trevor and Ruby. And I just want to call attention to, you know, we're pushing here in Ruby's case, um, you know, assessing sources for bias or for missing information um, and noticing what's there and what's not there. So we're helping learners demonstrate a depth of understanding um, oh, instead of that breadth. Um, we're digging in on some discipline specific higher order thinking, as well as transferable skills. Um, Trevor talking about, you know, how to keep his work lean and um, really include only what is essential and helpful to the work. Um, and also clearly embedding skills and competencies that kids can use going forward. So thank you both for that. And now I'm gonna, let Diane share her piece. So thank you, Diane. Thanks, Colleen. Um, I'm going to take you guys behind the scenes a little bit into what it takes to design assessments like you're seeing. So I'll go into a little bit more of how we created the project that Trevor um, presented. Um, so the first thing um, worth noting is that when we're designing units of study, um, we're always looking at those criteria for excellence that Colleen listed at the beginning, math problem solving, technical communication, these long-term enduring skills, and we're embedding them in our inquiry-based units of study. 
Our units are driven by essential questions. We collaborate to design them, and we do um, use the state and national standards to inform the content of the curriculum. Um, a project like you saw from uh, Trevor or from Ruby is usually the summative assessment for the unit. This is not happening every day. This, the kids build toward this, and then the project is the culminating experience that drives and showcases their learning. Um, in the course that you saw the video from, um, the driving question for the entire calculus course is how can we quantify and describe change? Um, and the goal with that question is to create um, an entry point where even if you know absolutely nothing about calculus, you know the, the big idea that's driving your work. We're going to figure out um, how we can figure out how things are changing and how we can measure that change and, and pinpoint it. Um, so even if a lot of the math behind uh, uh, Trevor's uh, presentation is something you haven't spent some time with recently, um, I hope that you were able to see how he was trying to capture the notion of um, describing how fast something was changing at an instant. When we design an assessment, um, we're thinking about a lot of things um, in the context of the unit. Um, I'm a math teacher, and so the stuff that kids are learning matter to me as much as the longer term skills. So I'm always outlining which concepts do the kids need to show mastery of? Um, how do I want the students to demonstrate and apply what they know? Um, what are the criteria that are going to define excellent performance? And what will students do once I give them feedback on that performance, um, especially if they haven't yet shown mastery? And off to the side here, you'll see the rubric for the assessment that I used to give feedback um, for, for the project that Trevor presented. Um, I'm going to take you on a little tour of the different components of this rubric because I think they showcase the ways that we design the work that we do. Um, the first thing that you might notice is that there are two dimensions to the goals that are here. One dimension is the technical communication. Um, that's the longer term skill that transcends any particular math content. Students are, students are being assessed on that skill from grade 7 to grade 12, and it doesn't change. It, they just get more and more sophisticated at it. Um, so this is not unlike, um, for those of you who use the Common Core, the mathematical practices um, are the same expectations starting in kindergarten and moving all the way through grade 12. Um, and so our criteria for excellence in technical communication are the same overarching deep skill. Um, and then in a unit of study, I will have particular math content goals. Um, these are specific things that I want students to master. You shouldn't take a calculus course and not know what a derivative is. Um, so that's, that's a non-negotiable for me um, in this particular unit. And those standards come again from the Common Core Content Standards or the state and national standards. Um, or if you're teaching an AP course, you know that's a well outlined set of stuff that kids need to know. Um, in technical communication, this is um, pulled directly from the rubric. Um, these four lines on the rubric are the way that I took those criteria for excellence and um, adapted them specifically to what I was looking for on this assignment. So while the school-wide language is the same, the, um, the language on the rubric is specified to the project. So you see in here, for instance, a specific reference to formal calculus terminology, which I would not ask a seventh grader for. And then the other component on the rubric um, is the math content. Um, on, this, uh, on this particular assignment, I, I chose to, um, to write these content standards as questions, because that also, I think, helped students decide what some of the most important content to include in the presentation was. Um, when I assessed this work, um, I was looking for students to show mastery of this entire list of concepts, even if their technical communication was not yet meeting standards. So, um, so I really wanted to make sure that even if the communication was challenging, I had evidence that they had synthesized these concepts and, and could understand them well. Um, and as I said, this, this right here is the technical communication criteria for excellence language. 
um, th this is language that every math and science teacher in our school is using. It's like our common rubric. Um, but I don't take this word for word. Um, I adapt it um, and tailor it to the assessment. Um, and the same criteria apply across all divisions while the complexity of the tasks that we're asking for and the level of content knowledge we're asking for deepens and grows more sophisticated as the students grow. So um, ideally, Ruby and Trevor would describe becoming familiar with this language as very young students and getting better and better and better at it over their six years at Parker. Um, I don't know, I know the slides are going fast, so I'm not sure if you caught this. So I really wanna highlight this component. Um, across the top, Colleen already referenced the beginning approaching meeting way that we are um, giving students feedback uh, relative to cri criteria. I'm highlighting right now the parts on the rubric where I also ask students to revise. Um, that's a critical component of the work that students are doing. So everyone turned in this video, got some feedback from me, and then was invited to look at the assessment again and use that feedback to take their work further. Um, and this is not unique to my class. Um, this is a built-in part of our assessment system. The very language of the system is intended to emphasize growth over time, progress over time, the belief that you are going to meet standards eventually. And even that visual that Colleen showed with that little ramp um, is the idea that you're building up from beginning to approaching to meeting. Um, and the long-term goal is to meet standards like our technical communication standards with increasing autonomy and expertise. Um, it would be okay on this assessment to not yet meet standards in uh, technical communication. As a senior, you're probably closer to doing that the first time than you were when you were a ninth grader. Um, but do you mind going back just a minute, Colleen? There was one more thing. Um, the, the other thing that um, is just worth noting is that in our school, kids are, um, are gathering evidence of their work over time and, and putting it into portfolios. So these, um, these uh, projects are intended to, um, uh, to be showcased in a student portfolio. Thanks. Um, so again, to, to reemphasize on this project, um, if students didn't meet the content standards, they went back to the drawing board and they definitely had to revise that part. For technical communication, if they did not meet, meet standards, they got to revise that part. And that's the, um, the, the difference. Um, the portfolio is the driver for why I might wish to revise the technical communication skills, in addition to, of course, my internal motivation to get better at something. When we give feedback, it takes two forms. We're both scoring using check marks on the rubric, and we're also giving narrative feedback that highlights the strengths and the next steps students should take. And here's what that looks like. Um, you'll see the, this is the same rubric language I was showing before. The blue checks are my first round of feedback to a student. Trevor, this is not your rubric. I thought it would be <laughs> worth showing somebody else's work rather than yours so that you could remain anonymous in that vein, although yours was excellent. Um, so the student initially, um, you can see that there were some, some places that were really strong work and some places where they needed to do work and their overall holistic assessment was approaching. They went back to the drawing board. I starred the places that they must revise. They revised other work as well. And the red checks now show that they were meeting standards with um, having used my feedback. And this is what the written feedback to students on that same rubric would look like. You see in black, my first round of comments really probing the students thinking, giving specific evidence of what they can do well and where they need to target their work. And then the typing in red is my feedback following the student's second take. And you'll see across the bottom as well, I've noted that the piece came in on time. We're looking for kids to develop good habits too. Um, the first round in blue, um, it was not yet eligible for the portfolio because it did not yet meet standards. After revision, you'll see now I have a red circle on the yes because this, this piece met standards and was ready to go in the student's portfolio. 
And ideally, if we design these well, each assessment works for a range of learning needs. Um, I, I believe it promotes academic integrity because it's, you know, you don't have to worry about not doing well the first time or, you know, getting it exactly right. You want to do well and you get a chance to realize where you fell short and step up again, rather than feeling like everything's on the line um, the first time. Um, and some final notes, um, we'll move back to our, um, our closing remarks. Thanks, Colleen. Yeah, and I think, Diane, I'm hearing we have a ton of questions. Yep. So I might, I might just let us um, pause and we could close at the very end with these. Um, how does that sound to you, Allison? Yeah, that sounds good. George, um, yeah. Yeah, okay. so we do have um, questions uh, from our uh, attendees. And I, I think one of the ones that I wanna start with because um, you know, particularly at the high school level, it seems to be one that we hear a lot, which is how does this translate into report cards and transcripts? Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so we have the luxury of having designed a school that doesn't give regular grades in any way, shape or form. We do a narrative transcript. So those paragraphs that you saw on the rubric turn into a paragraph that I write about the student at the end of the semester as their narrative summary for the course. Um, and then those get turned into um, a transcript that consolidates all those narratives. Um, so all the way through, students see paragraphs describing what they know and can do. And then they, um, they have a transcript that lists the courses that they've taken. Um, and successfully completed. And then a follow-up question to that is, how do colleges react to that type of reporting system and transcript system? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, most colleges um, have worked very well with us in that, um, in that format. Trevor, you're going through that process right now. Have you had any bumps in the road? Um, it, it's definitely different. It's a learning curve for colleges, but we do have um, special people at our colleges in the United States that work with um, Missy, which is our college counselor, um, and they help to understand our program. Mm -hmm. And also, but, yeah. also, sorry, Trevor, thank you. I'd also like to mention our friends at Great Schools Partnerships who have done uh, a study of uh, comparing uh, college admittances to um, kids admitted to colleges who came with traditional transcripts versus those who came with uh, more unique transcripts. Uh, and there's no statistical difference. They saw admissions at very competitive colleges to the whole range of schools and no difference. We also know that admissions teams uh, across this country um, have uh, an alternative transcript reviewer on their team. So colleges are prepared for this. It's a norm. We've been doing this at Parker for more than 20 years and getting students into very competitive um, and at quite a range of colleges. So it's it's not an issue. And when we think it does, it stops us from doing you know, what's potentially best for kids. So um, we've been courageous in this in this lane. Yeah, and it seems as though, uh, particularly during the pandemic, with the uh, difficulty of administering traditional standardized testing, that more and more colleges are going to to be open to different types of assessments and different mm -hmm. types of reporting for that. So I want to turn uh, to uh, Ruby and Trevor for a minute. Trevor, you talked about being an oral processor. <clears throat> and so one of the questions that came up was, how do you know that? Like, where did you learn about that? And I guess I would ask both you and Ruby to weigh in on that question. Uh, yeah, so I originally learned what normal processor was in my first year at Parker. We have a class called Seventh Seminar, and that's where we learn um, different types of learning, whether it be kinesthetic, um, whether it be visual, whether it be through note taking, all different forms. and. Um, I have just through many reflections and through um, going throughout each division at Parker, um, looking at different assessments, technical communication, LAMAS, um, I've been able to see, okay, I, I do very well when I can um, look through my material and maybe just reach out to a teacher or talk to a family member and um, say it out loud and to just get my thoughts going. 
to get my ideas going and then um, I can really get started with my work. But yeah, and teachers are very willing to work with me as well as my advisor uh, to implement my learning style into my education. Um, yeah. Ruby? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree with a lot of that stuff. In 7th SEM, they teach you a bunch of learning styles in a number of different ways. There, there is the visual, auditory, kinesthetic. They also teach you some uh, more specific ways of sorting them, like interpersonal versus just interpersonal. Uh, you learn these uh, fun methods, like are you a microscope or a beach ball learner and what all of those mean. So we uh, go through a bunch of different learning styles, just trying to find yours, because that's you know, the first step to having an individualized education. And I'd say that I, I know my learning style, but it's kind of hard to put into words, like of all the labels that we've all found. I just kind of know it by, I know that I work this way and I just explain it as it comes along. And, you know, that's fine because the only people who need to understand is me and my teacher. Awesome. Yeah, I wanted to add on to that, that um, Parker really encourages students to understand themselves well, to use their minds well, and to, um, to know how to learn and in their own way. Um, and you can see that through the different classes that we take and um, that class and seminars that we really encourage the diversity and the types of learning at Parker. And we, that really encourages each student to flourish in their own way. That's great, Trevor. As someone was asking too about how do we cultivate this kind of student autonomy that you're both showing and so many other students at Parker. And, you know, I think part of that is we ask ourselves as a community of educators there, um, what are we doing as a, you know, with each other as adults. Um, so for example, when I get feedback on my role as director of the Sizer Teacher Center, it's, you know, verbal narrative feedback. Um, I don't get, you know, an 89 <laughs> or, a, you know, a B plus or so, you know, that just isn't, there's, there's no, that's not realistic in the real world after high school and college. So, um, you know, we're interacting with you, Ruby and Trevor, and all students at Parker in many of the same ways that adults hope to be interacted with. You know, I hope never to get, you know, a, a number grade as a performance indicator for myself as an adult. So we don't want that for you. You know, we think you grow better when you get narrative feedback. Um, also what that contributes to, because I've seen this in other places, um, when there is a number or a letter, it also drives more com competition among students, which can generate an, a less than healthy culture. So the vibration that I see at Parker is students really supporting each other, lifting each other up, wanting the best for each other's growth and achievement and well-being. Thanks, Colleen. Uh, another question that came up is about the collaboration that takes place between teachers mm -hmm. in order to build the kinds of assessments that you use. So I'm wondering if maybe um, Diane and Colleen, you could talk a little bit about collaboration and, and are there any particular protocols that you use uh, in order to, to kind of frame the collaboration time? Absolutely. Um, yeah, and as I was scrolling through the questions, I saw um, questions that also relate to um, sustaining fidelity in the assessment system, having, having equity, um, ho holding high standards um, and not having grade inflation. All those are connected to this idea of teachers working together. Um, Colleen noted that we build in common planning time for all teachers teaching the same courses every day. Um, uh, and one of the things I expect of all my teachers is that we are getting together to look at student work regularly. So the assessment that you saw would come to the table. Uh, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I and, um, you know, four of my colleagues would look at that work together, score it together, 
discuss our, our scoring, calibrate to make sure that we hold similar expectations across the course, and then go score the rest of our student work. Um, and we keep an eye on, um, on how we're, we're using our standards to make sure that, that Colleen's class doesn't look different than my class. Um, um, and along the way, um, the, the shift from uh, an ABCDF system to a beginning approaching meeting and exceeding is the, the little E that you saw in the end, um, actually keeps us away from grade inflation because that feeling of um, you know, not wanting to penalize a student for something that was um, uh, obviously tricky that they're on the verge of knowing or knowing what it will cost students in their average, that feeling is not there. I can turn the work back to a kid and say, I want you to work on this. You're so close. I want you to push this further. And the student doesn't experience that as a penalty. There's no average I have to worry about. So it, it frees me to keep holding that high expectation because the student can work more. And, it, and using my colleagues allows me to keep, um, keep focused on what that high expectation is. This assessment, by the way, um, my colleague, John Bohannon, is the first person to design it, and he gave it as an exam, and we've taken it through three or four iterations as a team. Great. So questions keep coming in from Trevor and Ruby, not unsurprisingly. Uh, <laughs> everyone wants to hear from our students when we have students on our webinars. So a question, uh, Trevor and Ruby, for you to, to think about is, how do the assessments that you shared with us today build on your experiences of assessments in your lower grades, in middle school and maybe even in elementary school? Mm -hmm. Do you see you know, that there's a relationship between the kinds of assessments that you shared with us today? Is this a relationship between the assessments I've done at Parker and at a traditional public school? or the assessments that I've, or the way that I have progressed throughout assessments at the beginning of my time at Parker and where I am now at Parker. Why don't we start out with your time at Parker and then maybe you can also reflect on how it's different or similar to what you experienced before Parker. Okay. Um, so specifically, it's, it's different for each skill area and it's different for arts and humanities and math, science and technology. Um, but I can specifically say for technical communication, um, like I said, I, I focused on quantity over quality instead of quality over quantity. And I would usually write a lot of text, a lot of text, a lot of filler. Um, and you would, you would be asking yourself as the teacher, what, what is he trying to say? What are the essential points here? You know, maybe you're writing a 12 page paper that only needs to be five pages. And I, that would just get lost to me. And so um, over time, I've been able to keep that text more succinct, uh, use, depend more on visual aid and um, connect my text to the visual aid, work on transitions, and um, that has been a big growth point. And there's been different types of technical communication. You know, I, I've used PowerPoint, but um, there's many different kinds. And uh, so, yeah, so it, that works for technical communication. And I don't know, Ruby, if you want to go off of that, and then I can come back if you want to talk about um, before Parker and how it's similar or different between work I've done in my um, middle school before and now at Parker. Yeah, my assessment journey at Parker has been, um, yeah, very enlightening. I'd say that the big thing that I've definitely learned, and I guess this is kind of more comparing to uh, my old school, is um, how to work with people. Obviously, like sometimes peers, sometimes we do assessments together, but also working with teachers and um, how to also find outside resources. Because definitely before Parker, I was a very independent person and that was fine, but it was always kind of my teachers would just say, OK, go go in the corner and do your own thing because, you know, it's not really set up for us to support you. So if you can do your own thing, then just go do it. But at Parker, definitely uh, students who do their own thing is very kind of integrated, I guess, into the classroom and everybody gets to come together and share their methods. And that definitely 
taught me a lot more to kind of uh, stop relying like exclusively on myself and, you know, like ask questions, ask my teachers, ask my peers. And I think that that shows in my assessments when like you look at early ones, it is just kind of just about me or like just about the one thing that we had to read or look at. But when they go on, you start seeing a lot more like kind of relating to the outside world and all of that. Yeah, that's my assessment journey. Awesome. Um, I, I saw another question, sorry, just to interject, George uh, um, and Trevor, uh, about why do we just have Spanish? Um, and, you know, I think something about Parker and charter schools uh, broadly is that we've got to keep things lean. We're on a lean budget and um, we're also trying not to be the shopping mall high school. You know, we, we really want to be narrow and deep in what we're doing. And so there was a deliberate choice to have Spanish be the second language of the entire school. Um, and it's nice to see students um, when we're in school uh, conversing in Spanish on the side or greeting each other as such in hallways. And um, it's really neat to have sort of a community second language. That's great. Thank you, Colleen. Mm -hmm. There was a question about the exceeds column. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Sorry, so um, so um, we we do have a fourth category, exceeds. Um, we are expecting students to meet. Exceeds is above and beyond. Um, and we've tried hard to, this goes back to the great inflation question. Um, we've tried hard to avoid exceeds becoming the new meets, right? So, so we save exceeds for those moments when a student truly goes above and beyond truly does something exceptional, unexpected. I tell students, you got to knock my socks off. Um, and so we used to have it on the continuum, um, but we felt like that was always giving an implied message that what you were doing wasn't good enough. So we've taken to, we, we noodle around a lot with how to use our assessment system to communicate the messages that we, and beliefs that we want students to internalize. Um, so we, we go up to meets on our continuum and we've started writing in exceeds because that also visually conveys, you've, you've blown the top off this scale. We need to write in a new metric for what you just turned in. So students know it's there, um, but we don't want it to feel like a pressure cooker, um, never good enough experience. And we want it to stay rare so it feels really powerful and, um, and special. That's great. So last question, um, you know, we have many people who are attending today who don't have this type of assessment system in their school. And so what advice would you give them as to first steps? If, if they wanna transform, if they want to um, begin down the journey of uh, a more research-based essential assessment system, uh, what would your advice be? I mean, just to launch in, George, I think the, the main thing that creates the conditions for that is teachers having fewer preparations so that it makes room for more collaboration time. You know, when teachers are tethered to so many different courses, you know, we can't meet, George, if you and I teach the same thing, but you, you have four preps or three preps, I, I, we don't have the same time off. So how do we collaborate and start sharing the load and um, making things stronger and more engaging and more project-based for kids? You know, we have to lessen the expectations on teachers around number of preps and then move that time toward collaboration. Great, that's great advice. And I, and I imagine that's connected to a certain extent to the comment that you made about not wanting to be a shopping mall school, right? So really, you know, eliminating different levels. So you don't have five levels of a course, um, you know, uh, minimizing maybe the number of courses that are offered, like Spanish being the only world language. It's all connected, right? It's all mm -hmm. part of a design that you were able to implement for your school. 
Mm -hmm. And there are schools like ours, you know, first cousins out there um, who have what they call embedded honors. So, you know, they might, Sauhegan High School is one that does that, uh, where they have, they don't segregate students by ability, but within the course, if a student is interested in an honors designation, they might take on a few more challenging projects over the course of a semester or year. Um, so there are ways to do this that, you know, you might call hybrid um, approaches. Thank you. I, I wanna thank our panelists. I also wanna thank all of our attendees uh, for being with us today. Obviously, there were a ton of questions that came in. We weren't able to answer all of them. Many questions were about Parker. And so we would encourage you to go to the Parker Charter Schools website. You can find out more about the school there, or you can reach out to Colleen or Diane, uh, and you can get uh, more information about Parker and the Sizer Teacher Center from them. So that's going to wrap it for me. I'm going to turn it over to Allison to uh, to finish our, our webinar today. Allison? Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us uh, today. Again, I also wanna encourage you to reach out to Colleen at the Sizers Teacher Center. Um, they have a lot of different programs and offer professional development related to these topics that might be helpful for you in your school. For our panelists, my co-host George and everyone at NEASC, I'm Allison Geary. Thank you and take care.